Welcome to a very special issue of Starkey Soundbites. I'm Dave Fabry, Starkey's Chief Hearing Health Officer. And with me today, uh, this is a, a, a topic and uh, a podcast that I've really been looking forward to for a long time. Two, I don't think it's, it's hyperbole to say, two industry legends who've been witness to and instrumental in the development of the hearing aid industry, continuing to impact it and report on it and chronicle it as we've been discussing here prior to turning on the camera today. Uh, first, uh, uh, Mr. Bill Austin, uh, Starkey's founder and chair, and as well, Carl Strum, who is currently the editor-in-chief of Hearing Tracker and also someone that I've known both of you for, I hit, let's just say a few decades. A, we a can little say while. A, few, a little while. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's really a, a privilege to sit with both of you today and have a conversation a little bit about the way that you both have innovated in this industry from different ends of the spectrum and reported on it and continue to impact the industry in many ways today. And Bill, you can shrug all you want, but um, your humility uh, is in, in my mind, you know, it's you've made a tremendous, tremendous impact on this industry. And we have, and, and we're the young pups here. I've, <laughs> I've got, I've got thirty years. You've got forty, 40 years, and, and Bill has 60, two. 62, sixty-two years. years. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've oh, written right. articles before and said that you know, Bill, more than anybody I know, has had the fr kind of a front row front seat, seat to the hearing industry. Um, for, for 62 years. Through the history of hearing aids, uh, there's various myth, new inventions, great yeah. new inventions. Yes. And if you look back in the archives, you find that there's, those things were thought of before. Yeah. And not only that, fairly well stated before as far yeah. as explaining to patients how hearing aids work and right. what they can expect and what they can do. So I think that hearing aid history is, block, if you block it into pre-electric hearing aids, which is the acoustic devices, and those acoustic devices were designed to fit in canes, uh, walking sticks, uh, fans, there was bone conduction fans and air conduction fans and various bells, tubes, horns, right. and uh, those devices uh, certainly helped people for a long time. In fact, there was such a prolifer of those devices that in the in the late 1880s uh, and early 90s, there were ca big catalogs showing all manner of them that you could look for for the device you thought you would like mm -hmm. uh, to try to get some help from. Uh, a lot of otosclerosis then, yeah. the help that was supplied was limited. Uh, they didn't have the power to really help bad hearing losses. But what happened is they were better than nothing. It gave you a little boost. And so people were appreciative of that. They got a few more cues and they were able to hear. Well, and it's sort of interesting you, you bring up the pre-electronic era because I think the way I'd like to channel the discussion is really on the technology and on the process because you've been highly influential in the process of dispensing and how hearing aids are sold in the market and you've been so over decades. But in that pre-electronic era, I mean, many people who are new to the profession may you know, have been interested in the past few years that there were bone conduction hearing aids that would actually vibrate your teeth. Yes, um, people were biting on in your, in your, you in your museum. They you were, uh, that was a common uh, process used uh, uh, in the in the late 1800s. Right. They right. would uh, create a, a hearing fan that was Bakelite. Uh, it was a thin plastic, mm -hmm. and the person would. Uh, you know, have a fan, mm -hmm. and on the back of the fan there was a, ne a network of strings that went out to the edges, which you could apply tension to the fan mm -hmm. and get just the right tension for the right vibration from the sound. So when someone was speaking, like in church, a minister, the wearer could discreetly put the edge of the fan between their teeth and bite it, 
pull on the strings and uh, direct the fan right. towards the, kind of direct it discreetly towards the sound source and help their hearing. So, and there were other, uh, you know, all kinds of efforts that were well, made. And the fan one was a really a multi-purpose, multi-function device in the sense that if it got a little hot in the place of worship, you well, could use it as a fan. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 that's it. true. They didn't have air conditioning <laughs> no. then. The one fan I showed you, Carl, was actually given me by the patient who used it. Hmm. And I fit her with a <laughs> hearing aid. She'd lived that long. Wow. Wow. And it was, you know, many years ago. And But that's what I mean about if you're old enough, then you remember the original guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. So I, uh, and then, I knew people who used those, who used carbon electric hearing aids and vacuum tube aids. We still service vacuum tube aids when we first started all make mm -hmm. repair. Okay. And you probably still saw some of the A and B battery types of aids. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. 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 And when you came in, you would have to, you would show the the ladies, how they could harness those things up and not have anyone see them. Mm -hmm. So cosme cosmetics have always been a part of the They wear the battery packs often yeah. on the hip. Right. Where with the, the bigger skirts of the day, that, mm -hmm. right. that wasn't noticed. Right. <laughs> so those were the early days of powered devices, but they used carbon. Carbon batteries were the first powered, weren't they? The microphone was carbon. Okay. The battery was not carbon. Battery, what was the battery composition? The battery composition it was, was uh, it wasn't mercury, oh, no, was it? it was uh, uh, alkaline. Alkaline, oh, okay. right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, they had uh, that battery as a source of power to the microphone. Okay. It was, the microphones were big, Enormous. so you'd yeah. wear them outside on your yeah. chest. Looked like you had a big metal. Right. Yeah. And on the back, you could adjust the volume. Okay. And uh, you got a little better boost than you could get out of the the fans and right. the acoustic things. And everybody in my generation saw the, you know, the church the church microphones that you picked up from the, hmm. from the teens, yeah, and you, you know, could and plug it in and in. hold right. it with a handle yep. to your ear. Yeah, like a, an old telephone. That's one of the first expo. Uh, that's sure. the first thing that I remember about the, in the in the yeah. early '60s and you know mid '60s yeah. about hearing aids. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, we saw also in the museum some of the early hearing aids from the early '50s. Hearing aids were among the very first medical devices, certainly to use integrated circuits and transistors. Well, they didn't transistors use first. You know, integrated and then circuits integrated didn't circuit come came until later. about the early 60s. Yeah. Transistors came in the early 50s, 50s. And vacuum tube aids came in the early 20s. Right. Okay. That's, uh, so there was, uh, the World War II was in there, and there was a big uh, focus on supplying the war effort. And uh, so hearing aid, uh, yeah. kind of stayed at its point that it was in in the 30s, you know, evolving slightly, right. but still vacuum tubes. Uh, and there were a lot of, a lot of... People used, tried to make them smaller. You said that Sonotone was like one of the, one of the original kind of families of it, and, and others branched off of it, but there were a lot of hearing aid... Com like you, you showed us a Zenith hearing aid... Um, yeah. So there were a lot of different... There companies. were a lot of different companies uh, in the U.S. and Europe. There were so many different people trying to make hearing aid, mm -hmm. hearing devices. Most of them didn't do too much volume. If they, and so you see a rare bottle now and then. Uh, a company that went away was Jim Earphone. GEM, and mm -hmm. they made quite a few hearing aids, but they vanished from the scene. Uh, Acousticon, the first electronic hearing aid company, and Sonotone, which started in about 1912, were the two big, big hearing aid companies okay. that spawned off everything underneath them. Now, E.A. Myers, uh, I think he started on his own with Radio Air in Pittsburgh. He was separated from the other guys. 
And that came out of the idea of a radio, where you'd use a vacuum tube radio after they were first made and you could turn up the volume. So his hearing aids were hmm. table models, okay. like radios, okay. the first ones. And uh, in the meantime, other people were making smaller vacuum tube aids. And and E.A. Myers, he, he, he uh, you, you, you pointed out that E.A. Myers, uh, his, his, uh, uh, his daughter had married Sam Liebarger. So. Uh, yeah, in fact, I think that might have been a granddaughter. Okay. Because E.A. Myers uh, was an older guy, and the okay. company was E.A. Myers and Sons. Okay. So when he started, he was there, uh, you know, a couple of years, and then it was the torch was passed to the Sons, and then I think one of the Sons' uh, daughters okay. married Sam Liebarger. And and Sam Liebarger was oftentimes thought of as kind of the grandfather of uh, acoustical standards and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he served on a lot of ANSI committees. Yeah. Did a lot of groundwork for yeah. modern yeah. hearing aids. They made uh, bone oscillators that were used not only for hearing aids but for uh, testing hearing for bone conduction tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the audiometers were using uh, radio ear oscillators. <laughs> and not not to not to. Uh, but to stick with Sam Liebarger for a moment, he had the Liebarger half gain rule. You've seen all of these different um, strategies for fitting hearing aids at the same time from that era all the way up to now. Um, and I'm sure you have your own way of uh, uh, secret recipe, as you will, <laughs> for, for fitting hearing aids. Look, it's not secret at all. <laughs> I have a... I have ideas. I think about things mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but people are looking for the easy way. Mm -hmm. My ways always require a lot of effort. Hearing is subjective. Hearing is individual. Hearing is unique to the human being. So if I want to do a good job, when a patient is in front of me, I'm not thinking about golfing or fishing. I'm not thinking about anything else except that one person. Mm -hmm. It's all that's on my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm gathering every bit of information I can get from them because little tiny things give you cues. I listen to what they say, I ask questions, and we do some basic measurements. We look at audiograms, which gives us a general idea. Mm -hmm. But the audiogram is not a, a very good predictor because I can have a, peop a patient with a very poor audiogram, very bad audiogram and good discram. I can have a patient with a much better audiogram and much better discram. I can have a patient with a poor audiogram that doesn't need nearly as much power as most people do, right. or as the real ear formula would say, you need it. So it's all wildly variant. So if you want to do a really good job, you just have to listen to the patient. They used to say, well, the early hearing aids, those were just amplifying devices. The early hearing aids had a whole series of different receivers for okay. different frequencies. There were, there were ways that we managed sound but fundamentally, if you give a person a clean sound that's distortion free, mm -hmm. and you have about a six dB per octave rise slope on it, mm -hmm. and you turn it up and you vent it properly, you're there. And that's about as good as you're gonna get. When you start trying to jerk the frequency response around according to the audiogram right. with very steep skirts, you, you cause harmonic distortion. The, the, the harmonics are no longer in line with the fundamentals. It's screwing everything up. Yeah. And, but people who only think audiograms try to follow that around. You right. can't follow that around. Right. That doesn't, that's not right. Yeah. Uh, the audi the audi and the other thing you gotta realize is the fundamental peak of receivers, that's the output transducer. That's the sound that's going into your ear. It doesn't matter what the circuit's doing. That peak is 
pretty much it's a it's the main factor. So you should know where it is, and it usually works to your advantage with most hearing losses. Mm-hmm. If you try to reverse slope amplify, you get a hearing aid that sounds just awful. That doesn't work. So even though the sound is down in the lows and it's rising, you still have to fit that with a 6 dB per octave rise or it won't sound good. And you'll lose uh, they won't use low, low energy, frequ- high frequency cues and upward spread of masking. It just doesn't work good. And it's, it creates a very bad sound. Hearing aids that sound really mellow to a person with normal hearing that don't sound like hearing aids Mm -hmm. work really good for hearing impaired people. So first we had carbon mics, then vacuum tubes, then transistors, Transistors. and it got more powerful Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. vacuum tubes and and it got more powerful (laughs) than tubes. But the sound didn't get better. It just changed it. And it gave you, allowed you to address a more severe hearing loss. Then you talked about uh, the early transistor aids, yep. and they were big and cumbersome. Yep. Eyeglass hearing aids were built into both temples in the very beginning, and thick, big things. Uh, and generally only uh, amplified unilaterally too, right? I right. Mean, Siemens patented the in-ear aid in 1928. They couldn't make one, they didn't make one, it was never made. Mm-hmm. They didn't probably didn't make any kind of an in ear aid until long after we did. But that didn't matter, I mean, it was an idea. People used to try to patent ideas, they still do. I, I never tried to patent ideas. I <laughs> think ideas are a dime a dozen. Accomplishing something is another, another subject. The first in the air aid was made in this country by uh, by a guy in Walnut Creek, California, named Les, Leslie Leal. Les Leal, and Les Leal found a florist in 1957 that had a gigantic ear. It was absolutely <laughs> huge. So he took a, pla- a plaster uh, cast of the ear plaster Paris, which we used in those days, and cast by the lost metal process like you would make a jewelry, a hollow shell that would fit this guy's ear. He nickel plated it, then gold plated it Hmm. with a thin layer of gold. So now he's had it as a shell and he could take the, the smallest parts at that time, which were still too big big. to really make in the ear hearing aids for anyone. But the size that uh, uh, Dahlberg used on his first Miracle Ear Aid, that would fit inside this thing because the guy's ear was so big. And uh, he made that but couldn't make any more. Then, you know, because nobody had ears that big. Then a, a couple years later, the parts were getting smaller. So by 19... Uh, 60, 61, they were trying to introduce that as a, a possible solution. I said at the time, it, it's not a good solution because you can't modify it because it's, it's cast metal. You can mm-hmm. right. grind through the thin metal. Uh, and, and you're doing ear molds. And, do that. and yeah. I was doing ear molds, so I, I said, oh, I'll just you know, hollow out the ear molds and mm-hmm. I can make them. So it wasn't uh, my idea. And by the way, the first dir- directional, which I said made, well, was made by Martin Witkowski at our Wilco factory, right. that wasn't really his idea. That idea came from the Bosch company. Hmm. You know, fuel injections. Yeah. Well, at one time they made hearing aids, but they did. They were a creative German company, like many German companies were. <laughs> and before World War II, a guy at Bosch wrote a patent hmm. for a directional microphone. And then it just went into the wayside and nobody ever thought it about it again hmm. until Witkowski started reading the patent and tried to make one by hand and did successfully hmm. in the first directional microphones 
even the ones that were sold to Mako or the early Mako directional behind the ear hearing aids were made by hand by by Wilco at, at the West. But then we couldn't we couldn't do them at scale, so that went to Knowles Electronics to make. And you, I mean, and how did you? Okay, so you you had all of this background from with your uncle Fred, start, starting with your uncle Fred, and then buying the original Starkey. Explain how you evolved into being such a powerhouse for in the ear hearing aids, and and you know one of your. I don't know. One of your many legacies, I think, is is really uh, kind of getting the whole ITE um, uh, hearing aid thing rolling in the in the United States. Well, there were reasons that I did it. Uh, people psychologically, if you have a hearing loss, the ears, the hearing aid should go in your ear. That's empty space. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't put your eyeglasses on the back of your head to see. <laughs> there are your eyes in front. So it, it, it makes sense to the patient. Secondly, if it's custom formed to the ear, you know, it'll ride with them. If they're playing tennis or moving around, they can do anything. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, uh, if you eliminate the tubing resonance from running through the tube, you can shift your energy peak a little higher, which is good because most losses are higher frequency in nature. You need more energy out there. And you could get subtle high frequency cues off of the pinna, from pinna effect. So there's a reason why I thought it was better. The reason why it was worse for all the other hearing aid companies is they were harder to make. Right. But remember, I said I never minded working hard. <laughs> All my ideas right. required hard work. They require skill and hard work. So when we send a person to open a, a, a new uh, production around the world, which we were opening, we would not send an ear mold tech with less than five years' experience of making shells for our hearing aids to open the, be there for the opening mm -hmm. because if they hadn't made literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them they couldn't get the nuances right so anyway I, there was a reason why I wanted to make them but the reason why Starkey is successful goes back to the reason that we're in business in the first place and that's why we've lasted I attribute it I don't attribute it to being a uh, smart businessman, clever salesman, la di da, what, anything else than this. I came to Minnesota to, because I wanted to be a missionary doctor. I intended to enroll in the University of Minnesota Medical School. I took a job making earpieces to make enough money to pay for my tuition. I had never had a quarter's tuition paid for me in my life, no books paid for me. There I was going to school, and an old man with a uh, bad, bad hearing loss came in, and they weren't able to help him. They called me upstairs, and I went to work on the guy. I made him uh, perfect fitting ear pieces that wouldn't leak. He's having a lot of feedback trouble before. And when he could hear, I saw in his face, I saw in his face what it meant to him to hear. I was just stunned because I never thought hearing was very important before that. I thought I was going to be a doctor and save lives. I was going to do important work with his right. two-bit hearing aid business. And when I saw what it meant to the patient, then I knew it was important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I rode home on the city bus. In the cantilever of the bus, there was a quote, quote, the true path to humility is not to stoop till you're lower than yourself, but rather st to stand at your true height against some greater nature that will show the real smallness of your greatest greatness. I saw that quote. I said, that's how I feel. I wanted to be yeah. challenged. Uh, so I got, I got home, and I sat on the upstairs single bed cot that I had to sleep on where I was staying, 
And I started talking to myself, just like I'm talking to you guys. And I said, Bill, the reason you want to be a doctor is so you can help people. If you do this work, you'll be able to help people and you won't kill anyone. And so I, the next thing I said was, how many people as a doctor can you help a day? 20, 25, night will fall. You'll get up the next day, another okay. 20, yeah. 25, and uh, you'll spend your life and you'll help a village. And I said, Bill, you're, you're not likely to impact the world. I decided right at that moment that I could be challenged by helping more people through the hands of many. I knew that I couldn't do much with my two hands. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I could find other people that accepted the values that I thought were important, if they respected those values and accepted them as their own, then we could build leverage. And we would stand on those values. And the leverage uh, would be the hands of many that would pull on the the leverage that we had to move the world. That's what I felt. And so I said, if you do this work, you can impact the world. I had a little rental house that I bought from scrapping cars. That's why I have those old cars over there today. I feel so bad about killing. Mm. I slayed a lot of them. Mm. Anyway, I, during the Korean War, metal was, had a good price, and I, I took them down. Uh, I bought this little rental house because I had more money than I needed to buy my first car. I bought my first car when I was not even quite 15, just mm. about 15. I knew as soon as I was 15, I could get a learner's permit. And I had a kid lined up down the road that was 16 and had a driver's license. And if he could ride with me, then I, I could drive. So I bought my car. I had enough money left. I bought this uh, little rental house. I sold that house for $3,000. I had to make a profit before I ran out of money. People tell you you gotta have financing for three years. You got a lot, of, if you start a business. I had enough financing for three months. <laughs> if I couldn't make it work within three months, I was out of business and I didn't know anybody that would give me money or loan me money. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask anyone, for, I wouldn't ask my father for money for sure and I wouldn't ask anyone else. Because how, how, why are they going to risk money on a, a crazy, how old were you at this crazy time? kid? Nineteen. Nineteen. So yeah. anyway, yes, I'm. I've got I've got this idea, and it was very slow, for a long time. I had to to sell hearing aids to to pay the bills, mm -hmm. and uh, worked on developing the in the ear hearing aid. I had enough, uh, far enough along that I started open a little factory and hired a guy from the Tone Master Hearing Aid Company in Peoria, Illinois, to, uh, to be the production manager. And was he, the, he, was he the gentleman you said made the best hearing, or made the best ear molds that you ever saw? Or oh, was that heck, heavens no, that was here, uh, Paul Jensen. Paul Jensen. So Jensen. I made my own ear molds then. <laughs> And uh, Paul made better hearing aid ear molds than I'd ever been able to make because he, he developed a, po uh, a process of pouring the, casting the shells hollow. I was taking a solid block and grinding them out. Oh. It was laborious and uh, it left the inside rough and varying thicknesses of shell, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you'd have to leave it thick enough so you couldn't see through it, but thin enough that you could get all your parts, and it was a little more work, mm -hmm. a lot more work. Mm -hmm. I took the parts over to, this is uh, early 1964, mm -hmm. over to Golden Tone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Golden Tone was... Uh, owned by a, a guy that owned a TV store named Johnston. And he'd acquired the Golden Tone Hearing Aid Company, which mm -hmm. had been in existent. He sold Zenith TVs. And, uh, 
anyway, uh, Ray Clark, a World War II uh, veteran that flew for England in War II, uh, had invented a cattle prod. Johnston said, I'll, I'll trade you the hearing aid company for the cattle prod. Well, <laughs> the cattle prod never went anywhere, and the hearing aid company didn't either. They were sitting in the building owned by Dan Lang and Henry Kuzman. And they, they, he hadn't paid the rent in over six months to Dan Lang. Dan owned the building, and they didn't know what they were going to do. And I came in and I said, I've got these components, and this is, I want to make these hearing aids. And Ray Clark said, well, we, we can't do that, but he showed me these old golden tone eyeglass aids on other aids. I said, no, I'm not interested. This is what I want. And I, I started to leave. It was by the front door, and a voice came from the back room and said, don't leave. Uh, I think we can do that. And so it was Dan Lang. I went back there, and so he started making hearing aids for me. And I was supposed to get $15 a hearing aid uh, override on any that Golden Tone sold. Took them in my car to the first IHS convention they ever went to. Mm -hmm. Paid the expenses. Signed up some people to buy the aids. Milt Tabell in Indianapolis. Indianapolis, Maury Perlman in Louisville, Kentucky, Lee Schaefer in Rochester, New York. They were all good customers that I, I brought on board. And, uh, but they never could pay me because they never had a lot, uh, enough money. Hmm. So I, I went on my way determining that wasn't going to work and just kept evolving and making my own hearing aids. And, uh, and Bill, that that was the that was the era of single line dispensing too, right? I mean, yeah, the, pretty much single single line. You had a brand, and that was and you it. Stuck to it. So, how did you get your feet in the door of the, of of those of those businesses and get get Starkey kicked well, off? Well, that was a, at that time I couldn't get decent service, so I I didn't like the way it was being done, and so I started a an all-make service business. And uh, I, I started uh, policies that were just different than anyone else. I, they were all parts and labor at that time. And it, you just pay to have your hearing aid repaired. And they'd charge you for a new receiver, or this or that, something else. Mm-hmm. You'd wear it two days and maybe drop it on the floor, the microphone. They'd say, well, it's the microphone this time. They'd charge again. There was no, the only warranty was on the part they replaced, and it was always a different part. I didn't like the whole system. It was set up for being dishonest and cheating the patients. So I said, uh, we're going to charge a flat charge. No matter what's wrong, we'll take care of it. We'll service any kind of hearing aid made including even old vacuum tube aids. We serviced everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, we said, uh, and we made them look like new and we sent them back. And uh, I said, you know, for the eyeglass aids, a lot of the, some of the dealers were afraid to heat and bend them because you could damage. The electrical components? Yeah, you could damage it. Mm-hmm. You had to do it mm-hmm. just right. I knew how to do it, but they didn't mm-hmm. know how to do it, a lot of them. And I said, go ahead and heat them and bend them. If you break them, we'll take care of it. No charge, we'll re- mm-hmm. recase them. Uh, because they need to fit decently. Mm-hmm. I wanted patients to be happy with hearing aids because I thought anyone saying something bad about our business Right. Not only reflected on the person that sold it in the company, but it reflected on the entire industry, and it made it 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 and it kept people from coming forward that needed help and should get help. So our policies were designed to 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 help the dispenser, help the patient, to please the patient, and and back them up. Well, that became a popular concept. Yeah. Within two years, we were the world's largest service place for all makes of hearing aids. 
And uh, so I kept working on the end of your aids, but that gave me entree to uh, the dealers across the country. Even if they sold something else, they sent service to us. Right. And once they knew me, they began to decide they could trust me. Sure. Uh, and I did the best I could for them every time. And was the leap to building hearing aids and, and, and selling them to these people, was that a, was that a big risk for you? What, what, no, it wasn't, it wasn't a big risk. Or, or was it more of what, I, what I said, I said to people, I would have a hearing aid that we'd finished after the pickup was gone in front of our building in St. Louis Park. Yes. And, and that last mail pickup had gone downtown. The last pickup was like 5.30 or something. Sure. It were six. If you didn't get it done by then, it didn't go to the next day. Mm -hmm. And so I'd take one hearing aid, drive it downtown in my car, walk up on the back loading dock at the main Minneapolis post office, talk to the people there, and ask them which mail, which bin was going out next to be sorted. Mm -hmm. And I would get be sure it was in the right bin. It went out because I said, the hearing aid is important to the patient. It might be a graduation, a, a wedding anniversary, who knows what it might be, but any day without hearing is not a good day. So I said, they need it back. And people would tell me when I'm getting in my car going downtown to people who work for me, said, that's stupid because it costs more for the gas to drive back and forth, even though gas was cheap then, then uh, we'd make in profit on that transaction. But I didn't mind losing money occasionally to keep our reputation really good. Our reputation had to be as good as it could possibly be. And I said, our reputation has to be good because it's our most valuable asset and we're going to do something besides just repairs. We're going to, I knew we were going to sell them hearing aids when right. I was satisfied that we had a mm. good product. <laughs> mm. I still wasn't satisfied. I couldn't make uh, adequate venting for the mild losses. Vents at those days in the, in the ear haze, we'd put tubes through and it didn't do it. Yeah. Finally, I had a guy, Austin Reynolds in Rochester, Minnesota. He came back and forth. Mm. This is already in 72 when I'm getting at the end mm. of my design. I'm making them for other people. And uh, in 72, and during the summer, I guess it was, he was saying, no, I'm still occluded, I'm still occluded. It went back and forth. Finally, I ca we cast through a great big cast through event like we yeah. use today. Yeah. And I thought surely we would have too much feedback, but we didn't. Yeah. And the guy was happy, there it was. His name was Austin Reynolds. So then I knew how to vent. It wasn't the tubes, it was those cast-in vents that we've used ever since. And I'd gotten Harold, uh, Paul Jensen, he was making all the molds for Starkey. Harold Starkey had a little ear mold company and that's how it, he got the name. And uh, I wanted his shells, I knew I needed the shells. So, August of 1970, I bought that little ear mold company for $13,000. It wasn't worth 13 cents, but it was incorporated and my business wasn't. It was much bigger. What I really was buying was Paul Jensen. And I could have, I could have hired Paul Jensen, but I didn't want to, I couldn't do that to, to Harold. He was a nice old guy and it would <laughs> put him out of business. I mean, so I bought his, he, went, he retired to Black Duck, Minnesota with his wife, who was a registered nurse to run a nursing home. Paul came to work for me. We had beautiful shells. Then I had to work on the, uh, the performance. So I, now I could fit the mild losses, but how could I fit the most profound losses? Mm -hmm. Well, Westinghouse in Canada was making an integrated circuit at mm -hmm. that time, which was the most powerful thing I could find. Mm -hmm. When we put that integrated circuit into the hearing aid for our push-pull, really bad losses, 
instead of the transistor circuit that we were making. And we made those transistors, we, we, we assembled the circuits, you know, with the capacitors and resistors, all of these peripheral parts that you have to have. But what we did was we beta checked our components to mm. make sure they matched. Mm. And other companies would get components that were graded. You get a transistor that's this grade, another transistor that's this grade, another transistor is that grade. And the factories would take from each grade to make a hearing aid. The hearing aid would vary all over the place. Yeah. By beta matching the hearing aids, I was able to get a little more dynamic range uh, that the components and make a better sounding hmm. device. Uh -huh. So we got a, a better sounding device mm -hmm. than uh, most of the hearing aids that were being sold. Mm -hmm. We had nice shells, we had everything, and then we got the push-pull circuit, and I was able to fit the worst hearing losses, mm -hmm. really bad hearing losses. I could fit everything with an in-ear aid. Mm -hmm. So I said, we're ready, January 1st, 1973. Mm -hmm. I s sent out a letter. There was no advertising, no flyers, no mm -hmm. brochures. Mm -hmm. I sent it out with this, the statement, the December statement came January 1st. I'd save on postage. I would only... Now, in that January letter, was that when you said, here's the hearing aid worthy of I, your consideration? Yes. I said, we do something other than make ear molds and service mm -hmm. hearing aids. We make an in-the-ear hearing aid worthy of your consideration. That was the words. I said, and then I went on to say, the provision of better hearing is unpredictable at best. No one knows how someone else hears except right. the patient. Right. So our hearing aids will be on 90-day trial. Right. That was considered heresy. Mm -hmm. Instead, the industry changed. Mm -hmm. we, we said the hearing aids have to be provided on trial. And I felt that because the industry couldn't afford a bad reputation from somebody. I said, they don't buy a piece of plastic. They mm -hmm. buy better hearing. Mm -hmm. And that's unpredictable at best, so we, it would be unconscionable for, for us to take their money for something that they thought they were buying that they didn't get. Mm -hmm. So I, I said that. And then I went on, the last thing I said was, furthermore, uh, we address the hearing loss, not the pocketbook. Right. So if you have a patient who can't afford our hearing aid. Just write Starkey Fund on the order, and we'll provide the same hearing aid for your poorest patient as we do, the wealthiest at no charge. And it was a trust thing only. Yeah. They didn't have to send in a, a financial statement. Mm -hmm. And our loss and damage coverage, you didn't need to send in a police report. It was all based on trust, which some of the companies tried to institute. <laughs> and uh, most of our people we're very trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And so those were our policies from the beginning. And uh, they were policies that were appreciated by the dispensers. Our hearing aids worked really good. And our problem was keeping up. Right. Yeah. Right. We didn't have a problem with advertising right. or trying to right. get our problem was keeping up with the orders because it just kept spreading. Uh, yeah, and it was really, yeah, you, you by then had perfected custom, you, you know, you had begun yeah. this trail well, of, were, of innovating in that space and really delivering. They were nice looking aids. The yep. edges had to be rounded, yep. edges, the battery doors had to be rounded. There was no square edges on it, so it would blend with the ear. Yep. And I said, you know, we're not making it invisible. It's not obtrusive. Right. When you look at someone, you should look at their eyes, not their, what the heck is right. that on right. their ear. Right. Your eyes shouldn't be drawn to the ear. Yeah. Not that it's not there, but it shouldn't be drawn yeah. there. And so those were our guidelines of what yeah. we did. And then with, with the 90-day trial, with a hearing aid that, you know, like you said, the advertising was to build a hearing aid worthy of your consideration. You already had the all-make repair, so you were yeah. servicing products that other single-line manufacturers we could do were, you know, and, the, yeah. and you were... You were providing them with an opportunity then. And for the next decade, from early 70s until 83, you continue to innovate in making better performing, smaller custom yeah, devices. I did. And then 83, 
You know, the other thing I think that pe- everyone remembers in 1983, President Reagan. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you fit him with a custom device when BTEs were the norm. Right? Because this is now an area that I was in in, in the early 80s. 70 to 80 percent of devices were behind the ear, but they were also fitted on one ear. And I think that's something that people don't talk about a lot, that you not only fit then President Reagan with a custom hearing aid, you fit him in both ears. Well, I'd been fitting people with both ears. I know. Since the 60s when I started, I didn't I didn't fit one ear. But you were zigging when other people were zagging. People were concentrating on one ear and you were fitting. What what led you to that? People, Revelation. People hear better with both ears. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And yeah. there was a lot of, you know, like Ernie Zelnick and guys like that were yeah. starting to accumulate some some good that evidence just, for that, just for makes that sense. at the time. So, you know, uh, in the 1970s, as I said early in the 70s, mm-hmm. uh, 1970, 70, 71, we did the real ear microphone yeah. with Dick Martin. Then, uh, We started making devices that would help people with niche problems that you couldn't mm-hmm. make money on it because mm-hmm. there wasn't enough volume, like headband bone conductions mm-hmm. for people with atresia ears, uh, power stethoscopes for hearing impaired doctors. Not a lot of doctors wanted to admit to a hearing loss. Mm-hmm. They thought it made them look incompetent. Mm-hmm. So I built it into the stethoscope tubing and made it black like the rest of the assembly and hopefully you know the patient wouldn't know any difference not only that the doctor could leave it in his ear and and it had a hearing aid function on Mm -hmm. so he could hear Mm -hmm. and then switch it into the steth mode right uh, and you did a lot of that i did all that creative stuff with with your with your engineers and all of the books uh the counseling books i said Hearing aid is more than the device itself. It involves the family, and uh, we need oral rehabilitation. I have I have uh, articles from in Hearing Instruments of you going back to the uh, back to the late 1960s. Anyway, there's probably yeah. some before that. So I I worked on that stuff. Mm-hmm. I, we made the first uh, tinnitus masker aids and tinnitus maskers for. Uh, guy in, in Portland, Oregon that was re- researching oh. tinnitus. Vernon. Uh, uh, yeah. Jack Vernon. Jack Vernon. And so we started working with him in the, in the 70s. So anyway, as the evolution goes along, we were selling the RE 12s and 3s and 4s mm-hmm. to universities to do probe mic research. We made the hearing science lab with, with mm-hmm. classic experiments in Acoustic, yeah. so they could have ga- it had gates and filters. You could do all simulate all kinds of things. You could make any kind of hearing aid you want off of this big thing, and but you could do other classic experiments. We made uh, HAL, a hearing aid yeah. laboratory, right. which had, was a little had a little acoustic chamber, and you could measure uh, responses like a fry box. Yeah. We made. An egg chair for testing, which was spun mold out of fiberglass, which was an egg that was padded inside and had speakers for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As a little bit of a interesting mm-hmm. test environment for people. And we all kinds of... And you did some of the, we were talking about, you did some of the uh, first real ear stuff with, and got some of that rolling as, as well. That was early on. Okay. And then we just kept evolving different things. All I did was I kept working on trying to help find ways to help people hear better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Starkey's still around today and successful is because our focus has been on what serving better. We have to serve better today than we did yesterday. And we have Mm -hmm. to serve better tomorrow than we serve today. Mm -hmm. We're always working on improving and climbing that mountain, and I think if I can reach tomorrow, it's going to be beautiful. And I think I'll just have to climb a little bit higher. And we're getting there. We're really getting there. I said in an article in 1980 or something, I think that if you said that uh, 
what's going to what's the future of the hearing aid industry or hearing aid business? I would say there is no future. The hearing aid in the future will involve more than just hearing people. Mm-hmm. It will be a communication bridge across language barriers, uh, mm-hmm. distance barriers. Hearing loss is just a barrier. We need connectivity to clouds and other devices today to get all the information we need. So the hearing aid has to do that. In 1998, in a, in a, in a meeting that we called uh, engineers mm-hmm. and people from around the world in Germany, I described this further because at that uh, at that time it wasn't possible in the 80s. And you had, I mean, you uh, present company included some real legends that you've em- employed over the years. Uh, Dave and Dale Thorsted and Jim Curran and Dave Earl Preeves. Harford and Dave Preves and um, you can go on and on. You know, people are that are employed because they want to be here. Uh, And as the keeper of the faith, I I can't let the ownership go uh, to a bunch of people, not because I want it or need it, but because they'll decide they've got to sell out for money. And I know I won't sell out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'll keep reinvesting that in the future because Mm -hmm. that's where I think we should go for the people we serve. We have to serve better. Mm -hmm. And we can do so much more. Uh, That's, this is the, it's a new generation of hearing aids now. So hearing aids have gotten smaller and smaller. And then we had digital hearing aids. Well, at the beginning, people said, oh my gosh, digital is wonderful, it's so much better. Well, the real reason for digital is so you can help people hear better. And so we had to evolve our ability to do that. And it took a little while to do that. And we are doing that today. Mm -hmm. And we've made really good digital hearing aids. They've gotten better and better and better. And the other companies have. But all of us have made hearing aids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they... We made the first device now that's not a hearing aid. I still don't know what to call it, <laughs> but it's it's beyond hearing aids, and because it doesn't have the limitations that hearing aids have always had, and so once those those limitations are taken away, we're able to do a lot more. But now that we can help people with normal hearing without having them feel like they're wearing a device that they're hearing normally only better, they have super hearing, mm. we, can, we can start adding features that make a hearing aid ubiquitous. You, you can't be without one. It's mm-hmm. like an iPhone because it will be, you know, your monitoring system for your health mm-hmm. will report that. It'll be... Uh, a uh, therapy system if you have if you fall it'll know before you fall it'll know that you're in a candidate for falling that you're going to mm-hmm. be falling soon it's going to do so much to help people and that's what i said years ago mm-hmm. we're going to help people be healthier live longer and perform to task better that's what a hearing aid does. A hearing aid will pr- help you perform the task better because it helps you hear and respond to people. It helps you perform the task better because it, you can tap your ear and connect to the cloud and say, who hit the most home runs last year? You can find out anything you want to know just mm-hmm. like that. The direction of the airport, what's the weather in Tokyo? It doesn't matter. You can ask and it's all there. And the, and the future and, with what and you're the talking hearing about aids with will, sensors will, and... Yeah, the hearing aids will talk to you in the future. They'll talk back. They'll mm-hmm. recognize your voice and other voices. Just, we have all of this potential coming at us. It's coming very fast. And uh, I realized that we couldn't do that with the, uh, the people we had. We'd been trying to make progress for years with the people we had. And I kept telling them... Mm-hmm. You know, we're not we're not getting anywhere. We're not getting anywhere, and that's when we uh, 
sent out a search for Achen, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. for a new head of engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to go outside the industry, and he was uh, a head of uh, artificial intelligence at Intel. And so the guy was deep in experience and very sharp. He had made Siri and what is it, all kinds of things. Oh, yeah. Did the robotic shows for the Super Bowl and other Drone. Things. So yeah. he's just a very visual, br brilliant, creative yes. guy. And so I, it ended up that I met him. He came here. And he really hadn't intended to go to work, but he'd written a paper about me. I'd never heard of anyone in my life, and there's <laughs> never been anyone since that had written, that had written a, a college uh, paper thesis or a uh, paper about me. And he'd chosen a public company, Microsoft, and a private company, uh, Starkey. And uh, anyway, he wanted to meet me. And so I took a big board, like you see the horse races at the track going up the board, and you, <laughs> you know, the guy that gets to the top wins the teddy bear or something. And, and so uh, I said, this is what we're going to do. These are all the things we're going to do to help people live longer, perform the task better, be healthier. Mm -hmm. And I said, some of them are going to be harder, than, more difficult than others. And I said, so that's okay. That's just one of the measurements we're going to do. We're going to do all these things. And that's what this, that's what we're, that's our future. That's what we're dedicated to doing is making a device that will help people better than we've ever helped them before. And that's why when I asked and you so in another I, interview, what, what's the future of hearing aids? You said, there is no future in hearing <laughs> aids. There, there's futures in, in, these, in these new types of yeah, devices. Right. Of that's course, what, they that, are going to compensate for... That's where the future will be. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because we focused on that, yeah. it's taken years and we've got billions of billions of bytes of sound information now that mm -hmm. we're working with. Our AI is getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Mm -hmm. So this, Achen estimates we're five years ahead of anyone else. And he said within another couple of years, he'll be 10 years ahead because we're, we're doing unbelievable things. In the meantime, uh, we keep trying to go to the next We'll keep trying to go to the next level. But Ajahn said, uh, I want to spend my, the rest of my life trying to help people and do something good instead of making uh, gadgets and things. So robots. So he's signed up and for the right reasons. Right. And that's why and our, people, our, our good people sign up because they buy into being part of that. Right. We're one team. No one can do it alone. But together we can impact the world in a positive way, and the world needs that now. And it needs something else that we have at Starkey. Our caring mm -hmm. that we reflect to people, it's deeply embedded in this company. Right. Deeply embedded. And so that respect that each individual is worth the best we can do for them is part of our culture and part of why we go to work. It makes our life meaningful, it gives us purpose. And the people who buy into that find that this is a good place to work. Mm -hmm. I've also gotten the sense that that there is some, and there's a fair amount of, of levity that, or of, of um, your own way of determining which way you're going to go sometimes. I was talking to Earl Harford um, before he passed and asked him how he started that student education program. And, and apparently um, you didn't think it was going to work necessarily, but you said, well, go ahead and give this a shot. And it, 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 it really impacted some uh, influential audiologists down the line. Well, I've always done that. People will do more if they believe in something, if they have a passion for it. And so I may test them. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. But if they can beat on the table and say, I can make it work, I will make it work, if they have passion for it, then I'll support it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if they didn't have that passion, it wouldn't get there. Right. It wouldn't be that significant. So Earl believed that, and so I support it. We were you, oh, oh, go ahead. We were talking about uh, leg legacy before. What, what do you think? 
what what do you think you'll be remembered for and what do you want to be remembered for? Here's what I think that I'm remembered by people who will never know me and will mm-hmm. never know me because the caring that I reflect yeah. gets reflected to the family and the community. And that, it lights an inner light in people. It gives them hope. If they're cared about and someone thinks they're worth it and they have value, all of a sudden someone else will think it, they're worth it. So I think uh, probably my biggest legacy may not be hearing aid inventions, mm-hmm. although we've tried to push that, and mm-hmm. make other people keep up with us and copy us. Uh, I, our policies were very important. Mm-hmm. But probably the biggest legacy is is the caring, the, the light we reflect. And you personally have fitted a lot, light, of, the, lot of yeah. here, a lot of people all over a, the world. A lot of people all over the world. But that's what I think will only thing that'll be, that won't be remembered, but it will be p- become part of life ongoing. So I think as you reflect that light to someone of your, you've given your life, you've given a part of your life, a piece of time to them and only them because Mm -hmm. they were worth that piece Mm -hmm. of your life. And when you give that to them, it lights a light inside them and you can see that reflected back to you, which feels good. You're bathed in the light, it makes you stronger and you wanna go on and do more. But they reflect that light then on to others and that keeps being reflected forward and forward and forward. <clears throat> and I think, you know, that really summarizes, I mean, the, the issue of a hearing aid manufacturer thinking about the technology, but for as long as I've known you, you know, you, you operate by the mantra, you know, so the world may hear, and I've been in all corners of the world seeing you provide the opportunity for people to hear and connecting them providing that light looking forward. And I think it's because you haven't, you've always, you've not been paralyzed by the dogma of the moment. I mean, you brought up Leibarger from 1944 said a half gain fitting rule was gonna be the key to success in fitting hearing aids. I've watched you develop the WFA fitting model, which is based on super threshold, on audibility. It doesn't even need the audiogram. And because, why is that? Because you can scale it and you can get to so many more people in all corners of the world that doesn't depend on plugging something into the wall or using a piece of equipment, but it provides people with the opportunity and the chance to hear. You can quickly arrive at the sweet spot for their hearing. It's it's scalable, it's something we can do to bring hearing to people all around the world and it's not possible otherwise. It is. There's there's no no other other, way that you could have built it that way through audiometers, through a half game fitting rule, all you need there's is your There's too many hands. millions of people and it takes too long. <laughs> there's not, it's not, it's there's not that much equipment. It's so for me, it's that caring that and it's a solution that provides us a scalable and sustainable approach by involving the community and the people that are not there when you're able to go over and teach them and be there and fit them. But in that way, it takes a, a big, hairy, audacious goal <laughs> To be able to say, you know, brashly, so the world, I'm going to try to do, and I, I, I think you take that statement literally, because I've seen you get off a bus and fit someone that you saw struggling with hearing yeah, well, in, in more than one occasion. And, that's, and it's that caring. that's all I know how to do. Yeah. So I, I have to give what I can. I can't solve all the problems. There are many problems. Solve that world. one. There always have been, but I, I can do one thing that I know how to do. And so I I must do that one thing. Otherwise, who am I and what am I good for? (laughs) So it's it's very simple to me. So that's why I think people say, oh, I was a great salesman, or I was this, that, or something else, or Bill Austin was some sort of a genius. I'm not a genius, I'm not a great salesman. I've hired people that are smarter than I am. They're, They're all around here. 
But what I, what I think has kept Starkey going when a lot of companies have gone out of business is that uh, we had one goal. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't to make money, it was to help people. The people want to be helped. They don't want to be outsmarted. They don't want to be duped out of their money. But they're willing to re pay a good, humble servant that helps them. And that's the reward you've earned. So I've never wanted any money I could make from winning the lottery or Vegas or anywhere else. I want money that's <coughs> freely given to me because I've served well. That's good money. That money has soul. I can mm -hmm. do something with that. So it's, it's not bad to have competi competition. I knew we could do it better. <laughs> and the reason I knew we could do it better is because I was willing to work harder than anyone else. I was willing to stay there really late at night or all night. Mm -hmm. I used to work all night <coughs> uh, a couple days a week because I get to I'd be going too fast otherwise. I had to slow myself down. You worked late into the night in, in the lab, I've, I've heard. Oh yeah, I always, I did that on into my uh, 40s and 50s and 60s. Really, I think anyone can be successful in business. They just have to want to be a good servant. That's the only reason a business exists, is so it can serve. So the only thing you need to do is try to serve better. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you're in demand. And in, in a lot of the early years, Starkey <clears throat> wasn't always known as a technology company like it is today. It, it, you oftentimes anticipated, it seemed like you anticipated the needs of dispensing professionals before even they might have been able to articulate. Um, or you don't disagree? No, I don't disagree. Now that we have a real way to progress, mm -hmm. that we see a path clear for the future to progress on, we will move forward. And artificial intelligence, machine learning is going to be a big deal, a really mm -hmm. big deal. When, and you've proven, I mean, AI is a machine capable of doing, you know, you look at some of the visual things that it can do to pick out tumors in the body oh, with much greater precision than humans can. Better, to uh, be able to, you know, yeah. even some of the navigation, better, better vaccines, driving, better medicines, better vaccines, better all of that. It's going but, to but do huge things. The bridge that it hasn't crossed yet, and, and imagine, you know, it's, it's the ultimate challenge is it's currently not capable of displaying empathy the way the human can. As you mentioned, you know, that caring element of trying to understand focus and be present with every patient that you're with. Your focus is on that patient. And, and I think as long as clinicians remember that their role more than anything else is you, you don't know your patient until you know your patient and you have to invest yourself in them in order to give them that opportunity. So far, AI hasn't shown a propensity to be able to do that that will commoditize or eliminate our role for those who are willing to care enough. You've told me before that there aren't any supermen. There, there's, there are certain people who are really good at, at one or two things, yeah. um, but then you build a team around them and they become supermen. Well, and women. They're, they're supermen and women because uh, we prop each other up. We all have our flat spots, but uh, <laughs> right. that's, that's yeah. kind of hidden. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you bring the together, it's like bringing together a lot of facets on a diamond. The light they reflect as you have more facets is even more brilliant. So mm -hmm. we bring these facets, different people together with different talents. And the flaws are hidden inside. All that you see outside is the light. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good metaphor. Yeah. I like it. You've provided a lot of great quotes over the years that, that I've heard you say, but one of my favorite is when now, it, which is almost customary when you speak to our customers or our employees, people inevitably stand up and, and applaud you. And when you come up to the front of the room, you said, I'm not a big deal. Yeah, I usually but, say, I don't amount to much, but don't feel bad for me because you don't either. <laughs> Which, that but together, <laughs> right. together, together we can change the world. And I think that's a good way to 
end this because I think that's your legacy, Bill, is it really is that none of us alone, we can't do much, but together we can and we are changing the world. That was, that was the big vision in late February 1961 mm -hmm. when I saw the limitations of myself and faced them for the first time. I never mm -hmm. thought I had any limitations. Mm -hmm. I was going to be a, a great healer. And then I saw I can only do this much. Yeah. But if I can get other people that agree with me, right. then we can That's impact it. the world. That's your legacy to me. That's it. So thank you for that and for this discussion. And Carl, thanks for leading this discussion. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Th 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 thanks for, thanks yeah, for sharing you're your... Thanks, Carl. Your, thanks, your Dave. Philosophy and thank knowledge. you very much. Appreciate I, that. I, <laughs> I don't know anything. Uh, you know, what can I say? What I've said before. Mm. I just... I just like to go to work. <laughs>